Bom dia, boa tarde, boa noite a todos. É, meu nome é André Barcinski, sou jornalista, documentarista também, e quero dar as boas-vindas a todos aqui ao 13º Inédit. A essa... E hoje a gente tem uma conversa muito, muito especial, né, com uma, uma grande documentarista, fez filmes muito importantes aí pelos últimos 40, 50 anos, tem uma carreira muito longa, tanto é, em filmes dela ou em filmes em parceria com, com seu marido, D.A. Penbaker, grande documentarista que fez Monte Rey Pop, que fez tantos filmes importantes, fez o Don't Look Back sobre o Bob Dylan, e o Penny Baker morreu em 2019, e ele será um dos homenageados do Inédit desse ano. E a gente vai falar então com a grande é, Chris Hedges, direto de Nova York. Hello, Chris. Hello. Great to have you here. Thank you, Andre. Nice to be there. So good to, to have you. Uh, like, I want to start by asking about the, the retrospective that Inedit is going to do. Uh, mm -hmm. They're going to show two feature films and four sh short films, right? I think yeah. two of the big classics, right? The Penny Baker classics are going to be shown. Don't look back. And can you talk a little bit about the the your feelings about this retrospective, about this tribute he is receiving? Um, it's very exciting. Um, he's getting a lot of tributes now, and very much do. It's been a little hard because COVID. And the pandemic happened, you know, six months after Penny died. So um, a lot of the tributes, we didn't have a big tribute in New York yet. So we're, we're hoping to do that. But we just started a retrospective in, in the Hamptons outside of New York City uh, at a small theater in our town in Sag Harbor that burnt down. And uh, we finally, after six years, got it going again. And we started a retrospective there of Penny and My Films. And we started with Don't Look Back, which was very apt because it was on the weekend of Dylan's 80th birthday. Well, I, I gather it's really hard to do a retrospective of the films that you did with Penny and his films, because I mean, you guys were so prolific, right? I mean, you've been doing films for, uh, I mean, in a, in, a, in a rhythm that is pretty amazing. I mean, how is your, how is your, um, your take on that. I mean, you never stop shooting, do you? Looks um, like it, at least. <laughs> well, most recently, I've stopped shooting. Yeah, and, and yeah. Kind of went back into preservation and our archive. Um, you know, we were making a big effort to try to preserve, especially the films that we shot in 16 millimeter. Um, I wish we could show some other music films here that we did, only the Sur Survive, which was on um, Soul Music, or Down from the Mountain, which was on the Uh, filmmakers, the Coen Brothers um, score for Oh Brother Where Art Thou. Um, you know, there's just a lot of films, but then fortunately, music films get kind of tied up in distribution rights and, you know, sure. and we have to unravel some of those. And then also, you know, and this is part of our archive work is that the technology is always changing. So, yeah. um, you know, you have to get films up into today's standard in order to show them. About the archive, um, how is uh, the preservation? I mean, do you guys have you have the the rights to every film that that Penny and yourself shot? I mean, do, are they kept by yourself? How can you speak a little bit about this effort that you that you are doing? No, so, we we no. have part we have partners on a lot of films, and you know, in some films, you know, we don't own like uh, Depeche Mode uh, 101, which um, is owned by Sony, but they decided this year that they wanted to. Um, restore the film and the concert film and the music video and other films that we made when we shot that concert. Um, and so we spent, you know, about six months with them kind of going through everything and, and making a 4K version of the film and some new extras and, and you know, different things like that um, for them. Although we don't own that film, it's owned by, by Sony. But, um, you know, as well as, you know, same thing for uh, David Bowie, the Ziggy Stardust film. But, um, you know, films like Don't Look Back, that's co-owned uh, with Dylan and our company. Um, you know, so there's a variety of things that you have to work through. But the one thing that's always been very important for us is, you know, that we preserve these films, we save these films and their outtakes. So in our archive, you know, we also have the outtakes 
uh, of our films, and we've been dealing with them a lot recently. Um, we just, uh, we, we made a film, Penny and I, back in 1979, we started shooting a film on John DeLorean, who built the gullwing door stainless steel car that you see in the movie Back to the Future. Sure. And um, some filmmakers from Ireland uh, wanted to do a film on John DeLorean, both for Netflix and BBC. So they went through the outtakes of our film and um, have made a new show from it. So in some ways I've been working in film on the old Steambeck edit machine <laughs> more than I have, you know, on a computer. And we're also about to do a music film from our outtakes with um, some Canadian filmmakers that um, feel that this uh, uh, concert film that Penny shot in 1969 was um, like the, their Woodstock. He shot it in Toronto. Um, where some of the original rockers like uh, Chuck Berry, Little Richard, Jerry Lee Lewis, Bo Diddley were playing in a concert. And John Lennon, because they were his heroes, uh, decided that he would come. And he came with Eric Clapton and Yoko Ono and performed at the end of the show. Uh, it was right at the time that John and Yoko did their um, bed piece. Sure, um, bed in. Yes, the bed in for peace. And so... Um, I'm also going through the outtakes of that and finding some other things to use in, in another show. So how, how is the feeling of going back to an editing machine, an old editing machine? You know, it's kind of like riding a bike. <laughs> you, know, you, you kind of remember how to do it. Um, the hardest part for me is looking at myself 40 years ago <laughs> you know, when I'm taking sound or if I'm shooting and kind of get in the picture. So, uh, yeah, that, that's the hardest part. Can we speak a little bit about the the technological progress that happened during the years that you've been working in documentary? I mean, when you started, I gather the equipment was uh, very heavy. Can you talk a little bit about the, the pro how different um, was the process on these days? I mean, mm -hmm. you, you didn't have you had direct sound, but I mean, the equipment was probably gigantic, right? Um, it wasn't that it was gigantic. Um, I mean, the equipment, and, and we have this, and this is some of the historic part of our archive, is that we have these original 16 millimeter cameras that Penny engineered. Mm -hmm. um, they were made from 16 millimeter Oricon cameras, which were used during the war. They were cameras that were not sync sound cameras at the time. And one of the things that Penny Baker and um, Leacock and Mazels and Bob Drew did was they uh, through Life Magazine, they got money to engineer the first sync sound camera rig where the tape recorder and the camera were separate from each other so that um, when you're shooting something, you don't have to be tied to the sound person and be by you. So that was, you know, some of the first engineered cameras. And um, when I first started as a filmmaker, um, I came out of the art world and I um, you know, I first started making experimental films, avant-garde films, and then later segued into 16 millimeter, but the equipment was very expensive and you couldn't get your hands on it very easily. And that, that's pretty much how I ended up working with Penny is that he had equipment and um, I came and asked him for a job and, and started partnering with him and he, made a camera for me he kind of engineered one of his cameras and we had these his and her cameras that we filmed with um they held uh, a 10 minute roll of film uh, and uh the tape recorder went for a little over 20 minutes so you were always having to do this dance of you know changing the camera reel but the sound would keep rolling so you'd have something to kind of um, replace when you were making the film. Um, I mean, it was cumbersome, but um, we had a very efficient way of filming and, you know, a way that you could kind of jump in the car with your subject if they were going to, you know, take off and go somewhere uh, and do it very easily. Um, but, you know, it, it it's just uh, the dinosaur age <laughs> yeah, yeah. compared to where we are now. But did, did you and, and Penny did you uh, adopt uh, like new technologies as they appeared? I mean, how did you adapt to these, like the digital revolution? Did it help you? How, what do you think about that? 
Yeah. Well, the first revolution that happened when we were shooting film was videotape came out. And we were not um, first responders <laughs> to video, shooting on video. We, um, you know, it was a cumbersome process on video. Um, you know, you had to kind of do it in real time. So you'd have to kind of back up and keep redoing things when you're editing. Whereas on a steam back, you could kind of like digital editing, kind of chop things and replace things easily, as long as you didn't cut them up too much, yeah. then it became a problem. Um, so even um, kind of as the 90s went on, we switched to editing digitally. I had one of the first Avid editing machines. Okay. Um, I edited a music video on it um, and bought the very first three gigabyte hard drive, which about you know, kept the amount of footage I needed to make the show. Um, and it cost $3,000 for three gigabytes. So, I mean, <laughs> the whole process was very expensive, but we um, we kept shooting in film because it was a lasting medium. And also we really believed that the film should be in theaters. And at that point, um, transferring from video to film was not very good quality. So we, we stayed in film right up until I shot the film startup.com, which was okay. 1999. Yeah, it's a long time. So, yeah. so the, the War Room is a very influential documentary, very hands-on, very cinema verite. You did that all in film, on film. Yes, we shot on film and edited on film. I had already done the music video on the Avid, but it just, you didn't have the hard drive space to do a documentary because we tend to shoot a lot of footage. So we, we did that the old fashioned way. <laughs> but the, but the fact that on video you could shoot for like an hour instead of like 10 minutes on a camera didn't it appeal to you. I mean, you still prefer to, to, to keep faithful to the, to the, well, film. I kept, we kept faithful to film until the first kind of smaller DV cam cameras came out. Um, other than that, the projects we did, um, we just kept shooting on film and editing digitally. Uh, and it was cumbersome, but um, the quality was, was good. And yeah. the video cameras that were high quality uh, before that were pretty big cameras. And, um, you know, the Aton was a pr pretty streamlined, elegant yeah. 16 camera, which is what we switched to after we gave up on Penny's cameras. Okay, and let me ask you something about your process, about your creative process. I mean, how do you approach as a filmmaker, a subject? I was reading that, for instance, when you did the Depeche Mode film, you weren't really fans of Depeche Mode. I mean, Penny, I think, didn't even know who the band was, right? Right, uh, I mean, it wasn't that we weren't fans. We just, yeah, we didn't we didn't know of them, but that that's pretty common. Um, you know, Penny always tells this story about Don't Look Back, um, where Albert Grossman came to the office and, you know, ask, actually asked for Ricky Leacock first because Ricky was the more well-known filmmaker at the time. And Ricky came and um, Albert said, you know, I want to know if you want to make a, uh, a film about my client, Bob Dylan. And Ricky said, Bob who? <laughs> and so he said, well, maybe I'll wait for your partner, Penny Baker. And you know, so Penny had really just heard of, you know, Blown in the Wind or one song by yeah. Bob Dylan. He didn't really know Bob Dylan either, nor Bowie. When Bowie's manager came to him, he thought Bowie was Mark Bolan. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so it's, you know, it, that's, it's very common in many of our films that we don't know the subject that well, which kind of makes our films an, an exploration, uh, which is interesting for us. But are you the kind of filmmaker that you do, you do a lot, a lot of research and like a, a mm -hmm. screenplay for your for your films, or do you go as go as it goes along? Yeah, it just goes along with the with the with the subject and with what you're shooting. Uh, Penny did absolutely no research. <laughs> I would sometimes do a little research, but I mean, our stories are following real life and what happens to people, so you can't do that much research. Um, you know, the hardest part of our films is getting access and getting our subjects to like us and trust us and let us into their lives. Um, and then, you know, the research is 
kind of done along the way, like understanding what they're going to do next and, and being able to follow them. Did you, did you shoot, uh, I mean, besides you and Penny, who else was there? I mean, did you have a, a crew, a large crew? How big was it usually for, in these films? I, for most, yeah. in general. Uh, yeah, I mean, the nice thing about our music films is we get to hire our friends and kind of they come along on the adventure or part of the adventure with us. And, you know, that's really fun. And we love them. And most of the music films we've done have been somewhat financed by the record company or the producers. And, um, you know, it's made uh, it possible for us to then make the other stories like The War Room right. or Unlocking the Cage, which we just did, um, Startup, you know, all of those real life stories kind of are funded <laughs> from our music films because it's very hard to raise money for real life stories because people don't know what's going to happen. They don't know if it's going to be interesting, you know, and sometimes they don't know who the characters are. So um, that's a type of model that we used to do as we went along filming. But we keep our, you know, our crews very small. You know, sometimes it's just Penny and myself. Um, for a lot of the war room, it was Penny, myself, and Wendy Ettinger, who was our producer, who had worked in theater before and not worked in film at all, but she wanted to start to get into filmmaking and she kind of came along. We showed her how to change magazines and she came for most of the of the filming. But when we filmed, you know, at the end, when we filmed the debates and things that we need multiple cameras, then, you know, we hired our friends and they came along. And um, about access, uh, you spoke about have the difficult part, most difficult part of your job is having access to artists. Can you talk a little bit about, about how this access changed during the, the, the years? I mean, it seems to me that nowadays artists and famous people are much more protected by press relation people, press relations people or, or media uh, trainees and that kind of thing. Do you agree with that? Is it harder, let's say, to do a in-depth uh, research or in-depth study of a character, a famous person or a band today than it, than it was when you guys were doing it? I mean, in some ways it was because people weren't as familiar yeah. with what the camera could do. Um, in some ways they were more wary about microphones because, you know, they knew what microphones and sound yeah. can do and radio and, and that type of thing. But um, I, I think somewhere you know, in the 90s, a lot of lawyers became involved yeah. Yeah. and, you know, access became a bit more difficult and contractual and protected in a different way um, than it was in the beginning. But it's always it's always a matter of trust and, and you know, letting the subjects know that um, you're interested in what they're doing and, um, you know, that they have to trust you. But did that did you feel that there was a change in the in the in the years uh, with that kind of issue? I mean, was it harder for you to get access to these people to the people that you were filming, or or was for yourself was it pretty much the same experience? I think I don't know. It oh, a lot of the subjects were hard. It depends on you know what it was. Um, right now, one of the films we're trying to restore for our archive is a five-hour, three-part series that we did for PBS about President Jimmy Carter's energy bill. And it was difficult getting access for that. They pretty much thought we were snoops, um, and we really had to earn our access. That's from the major characters like the Secretary of Energy, James Schlesinger, or Jimmy Carter. Um, you know, people on that level were they were savvy about it and right. you know had to protect themselves somewhat not as much as today probably you couldn't get your cameras in certain places um we got some access um to some special areas during the making of that film until the three major networks and that's pretty much all there were three networks and pbs at that time mm -hmm. Um, realized that we were in there filming and they weren't allowed. And right. so they stopped us as much as the people we were filming. Um, later, when we filmed that film on John DeLorean, um, 
you know, it was somewhat critical because it was a war zone in Belfast, Ireland. Yep. And so, you know, and there were also a lot of company secrets, you know, that we were, sure. you know, party to. And, you know, we had to be careful about that in terms of the type of access or, you know, contract that we signed with them. When you start a new project, I mean, how do you structure the, the, the way that you're going to shoot? I mean, do you put a lot of thinking into that beforehand before you start shooting? Or do you just start shooting and see what happens? I mean, do you have a lot of pre-production? I don't mean research, but I mean just mm -hmm. the, the fact that, well, we're going to shoot the Pesh mode. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to do the bus. Then we're going to put this camera here. Does that happen a lot with you? I mean, how do you like to work? What is your method if you have, if you have a specific yeah. method? I mean, depending on what technology is around and what we're going to shoot on. And, um, you know, we just jump right in for the most part. A lot of times we just hear about the story so quickly that we just start shooting even before we've made a specific arrangement with the person just to kind of get to know them and they get to see what it's like for us to be around them. Uh, we try to shoot in a very small way and always have in terms of, you know, how much equipment we bring, if we even bring assistance, you know, hardly ever using lights, um, you know, not miking with like big boom poles from above. We try to do it in some other way, I use a lot of radio mics, things like that, just to make the people comfortable. So they're not, that we're not the, the, the focus of things that they yeah. are. I mean, it's different now. People, I think since especially 4K shooting has happened, I mean, people tend to go into situations with very big rigs. And I think people are more used to that now. Um, it seems like a whole different era <laughs> in some ways of filming because people are so used to being filmed and filming with their iPhones. And, yeah. you know, it, it's... The world is one big film. <laughs> yeah, it's true. But then at the same time, these um, stars, celebrities, be, it, be them politicians or sportsmen or artists or musicians, they're so used to using social media also as a platform to put their image out. It's, it, it, they, they don't actually, it's, I, I see it very rarely that they grant access, um, like total access to a stranger, for instance. You know, I think people are so accustomed nowadays to control their own image, don't you think? Um, I think you're probably right on that. I can't say that I've, I mean, in the past, I don't know how many years here, maybe six, seven years, I haven't directed that many movies. I did a um, virtual reality movie, um, you know, I did a short, um, but I haven't really stepped into kind of directing um, because of COVID and then uh, several years before that. So I've, once the equipment started getting too big and um, everybody wanted 4K and this and that, I've, I kind of stepped out of the directing arena and have been doing a lot more consulting and, uh, you know, and dealing with our archive and, and different things. But, you know, from what I see in other films, it, it seems like that, but I mean, for me, the most important thing that's happened is that the technology has been put in the hands of the people who are being filmed, and you know, any you know, people all over can make their own stories. When I started making films, it was pretty much a white man's world, yeah. Yeah. and you know, we filmed other cultures, and you know, it was our story about them, and sure. now people can make their own stories. And, and that's, I think, what's really important and really moving. It's funny that you say when, when equipment got really big, when you think that with the years, the passing of the years, equipment will get smaller, right? Not bigger, but, but you're but right. It has gotten yeah. bigger in some ways. I mean, our camera was, you know, even though it didn't shoot that much, it sat very comfortably on our shoulder, um, you know, had good lens and, you know, it, it wasn't cumbersome in that way. I mean, it was a bit heavy, but right. you know, a lot of the cameras that people are lugging around are really heavy. They have all sorts of devices. They look like a, a contraption walking around. It's true. It's true. Um, look like a robot sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> but I think they kind of like that, you know, it's almost like 
they get to be filmmakers or something. <laughs> and that's not really what we were about. Have you followed um, recent documentaries? I mean, is where do you like still like to watch other people's films? Are there films, recent films that you really enjoyed? Can you speak a little bit about that? Mm -hmm. um, well, I am part of the Academy of Motion yeah. Pictures, so um, you know we are charged with watching a lot of films. We had about 175 submissions last year. Um, we don't have to watch 175 each of us. We kind of get broken into groups, but you know we get about 60 films. So, you know there are a lot of films to watch, and and a lot of you know wonderful good films that are out there. Um, you know not all of them unfortunately get picked as shortlisted or as nominated films, but you know there were several I liked on the list. Uh, I definitely liked the film Time a lot. I thought it yeah. was a very poetic film. Yeah. It, it didn't win, right? It lost to the octopus teacher. Yeah, it didn't win, but I like the octopus too. How can you know? <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of the octopus teacher, I mean, Netflix and Amazon, and they, they've been putting out a lot of these docu-series, like you know, documentaries divided into episodes, like Tiger King, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. And to me, sometimes they seem much more like a reality show than a documentary because you can see it, it is very staged. And it's yeah. very scripted. Do you do you think of that too? I mean, do you agree? Do you because it's 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 become so popular, right? These kind of mm -hmm. these kind of documentaries. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, I've participated in some. I mean, when you say about Tiger King, that one was, you know, it was fascinating to all of us. But um, you know, it was very difficult for me when I mentioned I'd made a, a virtual reality film. It was actually about rescuing tigers. Really? And, one of the, and we rescued them from this horrible place in Colorado that had, you know, um, 90 tigers and some lions and bears. And, um, you know, they were all used for breeding. And, um, you know, they just make them have cub litters after cub litters. And then they take them to like a shopping mall and let kids handle them. And then, you know, and then they'd be thrown, you know, into some horrible place. Yeah. You know, and um, the Tiger King story actually um, targeted one of the sanctuaries that we brought some of the tigers to. So that was very difficult because they were very much manipulating a story yeah. to somebody yeah. and not really, you know, kind of pretending they were an animal film, an animal welfare film, but, you know, not really at all. But do you feel that these uh, sometimes these docu docu series are too scripted? They they don't seem real for I mean, yes, I think that, yeah, some are scripted. Obviously, that film was manipulated as well a lot, and you know, paid. Um, you know, I've been doing some edit consulting on some. I worked on season one of um, a series for HBO called The Vow, mm -hmm. uh, which was on this sex cult nexium yeah. or was yeah. a personal growth cult um and you know they they used much more kind of trying to follow in real life story although they were very lucky to have access to yeah. a lot of footage that happened to be shot through the years um mm -hmm. so you know it depends on the filmmaker um but um yeah i mean i think reality television has really made its mark on documentaries. Yes, it's been influencing a lot the, the genre, right? Yeah. yeah. Speaking of filmmakers, can you speak a little bit about your um, favorite filmmakers when you were starting to, to do films? I mean, who did you, because I, I guess, I mean, this generation of Penny Baker and Leacock and the, the, the brothers, the Males brothers were was probably a very big influence on you. I mean, who are the the directors that you like to watch? Well, when I began, um, you know, I, be I said I began as an artist because I had no idea that a woman could be a filmmaker. I mean, I'd heard of women, you know, in Hollywood back in the edit room with white gloves on, you know, cutting yeah. negative or something, but I didn't know of any women directors. So I didn't even think of it as something that I could do, especially because I grew up on the East Coast. And, you know, so Hollywood wasn't a big place in my mind. And so when I went into art school, some of the first films I saw were experimental films. And, um, you know, a few of them were made by women. Um, you know, Maya Deren, who made Meshes yeah. in the Afternoon, she was, you know, a very big influence for me to see 
um, you know, that she had made a film. And then just in films in general, because they weren't shown wildly and definitely not on television, whereas a lot of European cinema, I mean, Fellini, you know, was is one of my favorites and I've got Godard as well. And um, how I happened upon these documentaries, because the only documentaries I remember seeing were war footage documentaries from World War II or um, kind of, you know, underwater Jacques Cousteau yeah. <laughs> documentaries, yeah. you know? Um, and so um, when I was um, in school, I put on a film festival of experimental films. Um, and in that catalog were the films of Bob Drew and Penny and um, Al Mazels and Ricky Leacock. And um, I had heard about them. I hadn't seen them. So I decided to rent those as well and program them in the festival. And, um, and pretty much that was it. After seeing those films, um, you know, I, I really wasn't interested in doing experimental films anymore. You know, it was a very political time. It was, you know, the civil rights movement, the women's movement, the environmental movement, the Vietnam War. And it just seemed, you know, like, how could I do these very formalistic you know, films that I was doing. Um, and, you know, these were stories, you know, especially the Drew ones that, you know, had a character and drama and, you know, it almost seemed like I could film them myself. And the one that really encouraged me to go find actually Bob Drew, because he's the producer of them, although it was a film directed by Penny and a woman, Hope Bryden, was a film he made on Jane Fonda. And it was about Jane Fonda's Broadway debut, and she's this young, beautiful, you know, Barbarella era actress um, in a Broadway play. And, you know, the play closes after uh, one night. <laughs> it's really <laughs> awful, but the story is wonderful. And it, it, it's so much like the Hollywood films, you know, that you would see that were, you know, about let's put on a play, you know, right. Mickey Rooney or, you know, whatever. And so, you know, I thought, well, you know, these are films I could do, but I don't have to, you know, get actors or anything. I just have to find a story, you know, that has somebody who's really passionate and going through something. And uh, so after seeing that film in particular, I went to find Bob Drew and um, asked him if, you know, he had a job. And basically he said that uh, he didn't have any job, but, you know, why don't I go up the street and, you know, ask Penny Baker. And so really that's, that's how I landed in his office and, uh, and started working with him. And speaking of the, the Penny Baker films, the ones that you did with him and um, by, um, by, that he did by himself before you met him, what do you think, what are, you, are your favorite films from your canon, from the ones that you either produced or directed or from Penny Baker's films? I mean, can you talk a little bit about some of them? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, of course, Don't Look Back is one of my favorite films. I mean, I just think, you know, if I could have Bob Dylan in every one of my films, I'd be set for life. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, he's a character that is, you know, is endlessly intriguing to people. And, you know, it's just such a moment that yeah. Penny caught him, you know, in this period of time in his life where, yeah. you know, he was transitioning and... Um, it's just beautifully made, and, and, and I love that film. Um, you know, this, you know, each, you know, they're like children. <laughs> you like them all for separate reasons, even if they're struggling films or you know they're long and cumbersome, like the Energy War. But uh, you know, I think the War Room was pretty special. Um, yeah, you know, to be is. around people who are electing a president um, is a really special moment that it you is. go through. But you know, in each of the films. You know, I learned so much from the characters that we're filming, um, you know, the risks that they are taking and the losses that they endure and, and how they deal with loss. Um, you know, I've done several films where that happens. Um, I don't know if you ever saw our film Kings of Pastry, which is a yeah, yeah. pastry competition. Yeah. Um, but, you know, Jackie Pfeiffer was just, you know, he was a great character. And, you know, you, you watch kind of how he dealt with losing yep. and got through things and and you know and you have to base luck on these films because for us you know it ended up being lucky in the end yeah. that 
the guy who you think is going to lose because he drops this massive sugar sculpture <laughs> ends up winning. And, you know, the beloved Jackie who we follow through the film loses, but the theme of the film is marriage. And so then afterwards he marries his sweetheart. So, you know, he lost the collar, you know, the special collar, but he, he got the girl in the end. So you just have but to follow the stories. The, you, you spoke a little bit about the war room, and it's pretty amazing how influential that film is, right? I mean, it's not the first behind-the-scenes look at politicians, but it's certainly one of the most influential. I mean, you can see its influence in several other films that came after it. Do you agree? I mean, the thing about the war room is, you know, it seemed like a failed film in the beginning because our goal was to make a film about a man becoming president. Penny had tried to do this with Robert Kennedy. And um, actually one of the first films that I worked on with Penny was a film where he was filming Robert Kennedy going around New York with his children singing Christmas carols at school uh, with Sammy Davis Jr. And, um, you know, unfortunately that film never came to be, but it was an idea that we always tried to do. And we tried to make a, make the film several other campaigns before, um, but you know, there weren't that many document, that many democratic campaigns and we wanted to follow a democratic um, campaign. Um, so um, we finally, you know, tried to do the war room and with Wendy Ettinger and RJ Cutler, um, they came to us and said, you know, I think you should do a film on, an, on um, you know, somebody running for president this year. And we had tried with several other people who had come in and said that with us. And we basically said, well, you know, we need two things, money and access. And then, you know, we sent them away and they were this, you know, really nice young, young kids kind of. And, um, you know, and then they came back and, you know, they said, well, we have a little bit of money and we have some access um, to, um, you know, unfortunately, um, we couldn't get into the Bush campaign. We, they weren't going to let us in. And then, you know, Perot said he wasn't running and, you know, we couldn't get into the other campaigns. But, you know, they said that we got access to the staff of the Clinton campaign. And, you know, for us, it was really, you know, I don't know if you know the term booby prize, but it was yeah. like not a good thing because yeah. coming from New York and Clinton was from the South, you know, New York didn't like him. I mean, it was all over the paper, you know, like drop dead Clinton or something. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, you know, we thought, oh, well, I don't know. He's what we got. So, you know, we'll try and see if we can get our foot in the door. But in the end, Clinton ended up having a photographer and a guy writing a book that was following him around. So he didn't really want a film team following yeah. him around that much. So we ended up, you know, with the campaign staff. And um, luckily, we stumbled upon James Carville yeah. and, you know, James Carville is another character kind of like Bob Dylan that, yeah. you know, he's just always on and, you know, so intriguing to watch and see what he's going to come out with. And, you know, there was kind of a buddy story between him and George Stephanopoulos yeah. that was very moving. And, yeah. you know, I think that's what helped the story, but also because, you know, we had access to an inner part of the campaign that the press didn't get to see. And that really helped the film because, you know, everybody knew the end of our film because the end of the film is Clinton wins. Yeah. But what they didn't know really was that much about James Carville and, and how he ran that war room. And the idea of the war room is what has lived on, not our film, although our film is, you know, has somewhat of a reputation within film, but, um, the idea of a war room has continued in campaigns around the world. Sure. And James Carville, as well as Stanley Greenberg and several other, others from that Clinton campaign have gone on and, you know, coached presidents in many other countries on their campaigns. And I don't think you'll find a campaign or a lot of times a business that won't have the so-called war room that they sure. originated. But do you think in, in your in your large experience as a filmmaker, sometimes the best stories are with the supporting cast and not with the main cast, do you think? Yeah, I think I think sometimes it can be. I mean, you have to look and see where the story is. When we did the war room, you know, we looked at several other areas of the campaign and, and 
you know, it just, it just didn't seem interesting until we hit upon James and, you know, he was such a character. I mean, he kind of seemed like he was somebody's drunken uncle or something <laughs> that was part of the campaign. And then they told us, no, he's in charge of strategy. So, you know, it ended up, he was also at this very central position for everybody to report to. That's great. And, and let's talk a little bit about the music films that you did, that you mm -hmm. shot also. I mean, you did Depeche Mode and then you did Randy Newman. You worked with a lot of musicians, right? Were they, uh, which, which of these musicians were you a fan of when you started working with them? Or was it pretty much all like Depeche Mode? I mean, did you just start, start the, the, the film without really having a, uh, let's say a fan relationship to the, to the artist? Mm -hmm. um, well, the, one of the first films that we did was a very early music video for Randy Newman. And it was before MTV. And yeah. it was where they played little uh, music videos in these um, little projected booths they'd have at record stores. Um, but I was a huge fan of Randy Newman. Um, he was very suspicious of Kenny. <laughs> <laughs> really? Why yeah. is that? <laughs> um, you know, when people look at Don't Look Back, they look at it in different ways and they look at Dylan in different ways. I think if you like Bob Dylan, you, you know, love the film. If you think Bob Dylan is bratty or, you know, obnoxious or you don't like his music, yeah. you don't like the film. And it's not that Randy didn't like his music or Bob Dylan. I just think he was wary of the way that Bob Dylan was exposed right. in the film. Mm -hmm. And so he was worried about that. But that film, we were supposed to do um, his film, Short People, actually was the song that we were going to do. And uh, it just got all tied up uh, with the record company when we went out to L.A. because Randy Newman's idea of what he wanted to do was to have like some huge white you know, grand piano and have you know, a midget or a dwarf playing the piano and one of them would be axing the piano or he had some idea like that. And um, the record company just got so scared of that really? idea that they obviously didn't do it. And it had a lot of politically incorrect aspects to it. <laughs> um, and then, you know, he was playing in Baltimore and um, he had written that song Baltimore, which is a very beautiful song. And we just, you know, made the music video out of that and out of a huge blizzard um, that happened uh, when we were there. Um, but for Depeche Mode, we didn't know them um, or their music. And um, so Penny went out and watched them um, in a big concert, um, I think in California. And one of the things that the management said was that they have a very special relationship with their audience mm -hmm. and um, you could really see it when you saw them. I mean, they all, you know, had this you know, really individual style of dressing and, you know, were very influential for fashion, I think. Yeah. And, um, you know, they didn't follow that many bands um, and, you know, they, they were very different from what I remembered for take, for example, a film like Monterey Pop or the generation where I grew up, where everybody was in their own individual space yeah. <laughs> and yeah. whatever. This was kind of like a mass of people True. who kind of were together in their ideology and everything. Um, and but immediately we loved them and the songs. I mean, they remained friends for many years when they'd come to New York. We'd always go to dinner with them. Um, but it was hard at first. They had a lot of their friends working for them as roadies, yeah. and they were very protective of the band. And it took, you know, a several days before we were allowed to get on the bus with them. And, you know, it was kind of a, a standoff, let's say. Um, and in the end, you know, we were allowed to, you know, go forward and yeah. do it. But, you know, the, the life of a musician on the road, you know, it's not a very glamorous life. Not at all. They're going from all. city to city very quickly. And um, it's very rigorous in a certain way. Um, so we decided that we would incorporate the fans in the movie. And that was oh, yeah. the decision we made while we were filming it. 
and um, you know we decided to do it through a contest in this radio um, station in Long Island, and we just lucked out to just a, a fantastic group of kids. Yeah, yeah. The film is uh, as much about the fans as it is about the band. That's a pretty amazing thing about that film in particular, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the band always calls them the stars of the movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, they are really. I mean, it's so interesting. It doesn't look like a like a band like. A, doesn't look like the, the film was, let's say, produced by the, the record company, right? It look, it's such a candid look to, uh, to the fans, and it's really beautiful. Oh, well, thank you. A really beautiful film. Speaking of uh, music documentaries, I mean, they're becoming very, very popular in the last couple of years, right? We had 20 Feet to Stardom, and then we had Searching for Sugar Man. Have mm -hmm. you been, have you, did you see any, any of these music documentaries that, that caught your attention in the last times? I mean, the last years? Oh yeah, I mean, I've seen many of them. Um, yeah, both of those films I really liked. I mean, there's also films, you know, recently with archival footage, you know, everything from Aretha Franklin to oh, yeah. you know, quite a quite an interesting series on Apple TV now called 1971. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but although it's an archival film, it tries to put things mm -hmm. in context. And you know, what I like about it, and what I feel about kind of you know, making films and documentaries is that um, there's a kind of synergy between, you know, this art form and the times and yeah. what's going on in the times. And they're all kind of interacting with each other. And, you know, in film, it's both the technology now that you can film with has, you know, made a difference in a different type of movie than maybe we could have made, you know, back in the day. Um, but yeah, there's a lot, a lot of interesting um, music films. I mean, when, another when, person that we filmed um, that I really liked a lot was um, Suzanne Vega. We went on tour right, with her right. early on. Um, but musicians are just such incredible people to be around because they have this special talent that you know it can't be um, created. You know, it's it's. It's something that you either have or don't have, um, you know, especially, you know, people that are super charismatic that we yeah. filmed. Um, you know, we filmed a lot of different people when we did a series uh, called Vote for Change, which was, you know, to help the election back in 2004, I think it was. Yeah. But, um, it was the first time that we got to hang around with and film Bruce Springsteen. And yeah. I had never gone to a Springsteen concert before. and. You know, I wasn't sure I understood the myth of Bruce Springsteen until I saw him in person and performing. Um, it's a pretty amazing interaction yeah. with the audience, too. Yes, totally. Um, and then, you know, there's films that are so moving. When we did Only the Strong Survive, um, which we made with our friend Roger Friedman, and went around and tried to find a lot of the um, soul musicians, you know, yeah. that were still performing and, you know, still performing well. I mean, it was almost like, you know, it was stuck in their being and in their throat that they could still yeah. sing all these songs in, in almost the same ways as they sang them back in the 60s or early 70s. Um, and and got to know a lot of them. Um, Sam Moore became a, a sure. close friend. We, we went to the Cannes Film Festival with Sam, which was really fun and stayed in the condo with him. But, you know, others, you know, like um, Wilson Pickett, <laughs> incredible character, really? Isaac Hayes, yeah. um, you know, a lot of the other people that, you know, and Peebles, people that I think are getting some more notice now again. Sure. But, yeah. And, you know, it was really moving. They had such a community that supported them still, even though there were a lot of them were kind of forgotten. Right. In the places that they played. Some of them just played like in the basement lounge of, you know, some hotel. Yeah. Um, but they still kind of gave it their all, and they, you know, they didn't have an anger about them. It was they're quite beautiful. Yeah, this that film is uh, pretty interesting because um, it exemplifies something that I always thought about your work. I mean, comparing, let's say, your work to people, great other great filmmakers like Ken Burns or Lynn Novick, they do films usually that are about the past, about things that happen. Mm -hmm. And you and and Penny for we're always doing films about things that were happening at the time, right? Yeah. And have you ever thought about that? Is that for a reason? I mean, 
you were, you're more interested in the present than in the past. Does it make any sense <laughs> what I'm saying? Yes, it's no, it totally hard. does. I yeah. mean, it just, it's just exciting for us to do those type of films, to get to be around people um, who are passionate and taking risks or, um, you know, and just being able to watch them. It's, it's quite a privilege in some ways. And also it's exciting. It's almost like a detective story trying to figure out yeah. you know, what's going to happen. And, and that's a risk for us too, which I think is why is. some subjects let us follow them because they understand that we're also, you know, taking a chance by following yeah. the story and seeing what happens. And, you know, and sometimes it takes a long time to happen. I mean, in the last yeah. feature film we did for HBO, which was called Unlocking the Cage, where we mm -hmm. followed this attorney, Stephen Wise, who was trying to advocate that um, certain animals that are you know, highly sentient um, animals, um, like chimpanzees and elephants, um, dolphins, um, should be given some kind of right um, protection. And it was an interesting story to follow. Um, and it is, but the, but the risk, <laughs> but, but the risk of doing something that is in the present day is that it might not end up in as an interesting story, right? That's yeah. why I'm, I admire your work so much because you follow things that, I mean, when you're doing a film about the past, you start the film by knowing exactly what you're going to do, right? And that yeah. doesn't happen usually with you. Yeah, yeah, no, it's hard, and it's especially hard because it's very difficult to get funding, as I was saying, yeah, for those yeah. stories because people don't know what's going to happen. Why do we want to risk our money on that until you go ahead and film a lot of it and we see that there's a story there? Um, on Unlocking the Cage, because it was about a lawsuit, it ended up taking us a really long time, and, and you go through this process, which we did, where um, several of the chimpanzee plaintiffs all of a sudden died mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you know the story went a different yeah. way which made the story more interesting but it you know it added years to yeah. the filming for sure do you usually film more than one project at once or do you do you devote yourself to one project until it, it is finished um it's usually one project with some other little projects happening okay. around them. Um, mostly because we do so much of it ourselves, mm -hmm. um, you know, because we do the filming and taking sound and producing it and editing it. Um, you know, it takes a long time and we do those roles. And in some ways that's how we've been able to make films for so long is that we don't have to, hire all these people you know, yeah. just go out and do it ourselves um that's become increasingly harder for me yeah. more recently so you know that's why i've decided to put my efforts more specifically into our archive and preserving the films so we're, we're almost in the end i need to ask you i mean your future projects you said that you were working in the archives is that what you plan to to do in the last in the next years or um, yeah, I think so. I mean, I may try to direct something. I mean, we're still working through COVID here. Yeah, um, yeah. So, you know, a lot of what I started to do came out of, you know, being isolated during COVID as well. Um, so, um, you know, I may do another project uh, and direct something, uh, you know, something that's always in the back of my mind. But you know, it's hard to raise money, so I might just yeah. let somebody come to me <laughs> and say, I like your films, and would you do a film about this? Which is pretty much how we've made most of our movies. Oh, yeah, I surely hope you you do another film, and I hope also that you work on those outtakes, because I'm pretty sure there's some amazing stuff there. There really is, and, you know, hopefully we'll find a, a home that wants to take it on. Amazing, amazing. Chris, can I ask you to just invite the people for the Inedit Festival? It's the 13th edition here in Brazil, and it's my personal favorite film festival. You know, it's a documentary, a musical documentary film festival. And mm -hmm. if you could just ask, uh, invite everyone to watch the, the Penny Baker and your retrospective, please. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Chris Hedges, and I want to invite you to the In Edit Festival. Um, I've been to an In Edit Festival in Barcelona, 
And uh, this is one that I really wish I could be there with you, but uh, please join me in the festival and the Penny Baker retrospective and the other wonderful films that are showing here. Chris, thank you very much for your time. It's been really nice talking to you. Nice talking to you. Hope I get to see you at some point. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Let's let's wait for this to end. This nightmare. <laughs> yes. It's, it's it's ending sooner in the U.S. than in Brazil. We'll still have some some time to go. You know, situation is really bad here nowadays. Yeah. So your festival is totally virtual, correct? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, Marcelo's festival this year and last year and this year are going to be totally virtual. Mm -hmm. But it was it was a huge success last year because people from all over the country can can watch the films. You know, beforehand was was limited to the São Paulo crowd. Yeah. But yeah. I think they're, they're going to get record numbers this year, which is pretty good. That's great. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.